recording. Okay, I will call this meeting to order at 4.34 p.m. on this August 30th as acting chair today, 2023. We will start um, by identifying a minute taker for the meeting, which I believe the heir to that throne is none other than Laura Drucker, if they are available. It goes so fast, I know. Yes, I will do it. Thank you. Uh, I appreciate and apologize. Um, review, speaking of minutes, we have minutes from the last meeting. If anybody wants to read them or just vote to approve them, I think we typically read them ahead of the meeting. So we don't necessarily need to take time, but should I put them on the screen or anything? I can put them up for you. If Is there anybody who needs them posted to review? They're in the online meeting packet as well. Someone wants to move. I'll move to accept the minutes. Second. Okay, and I'll need your voice vote in no particular order. Selman? Yes. Roof? Yes. D? Yes. Drucker? Abstain. Breger? Oh, doing I didn't hear you. Is your audio? Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Yep. Okay, uh, I said yes. Okay, great. <laughs> Just wanted to make sure. Yeah. All right, thanks everybody. They're approved. All right. Who seconded that? Sorry. Uh, I did. D. Okay, thanks. Public comments. We have three members of the public here. If anyone wants to raise their hands, Stephanie can make you vocal. Otherwise, thank you so much for being here. We really appreciate having eyes on this and we have a hand up. Okay, Christine, you can go ahead and unmute yourself. Hi. Everybody hear me? Yes. Great. Yeah, I'm um, Christine. I am um, a parent in the public schools and um, also on the Transportation Advisory Committee. And Stella reached out to the Transportation Advisory Committee regarding the Safe Routes to School topic that y'all are discussing today um, and was just uh, looking for um, a little bit of uh, information regarding what the our committee has been up to in that realm. So I thought I would attend and give you the quick update. Um, so Safe Routes to School is um, actually a federal program. It's administered through the Mass Department of Transportation. Um, it's pretty expansive. The goal is to create walkable and bikeable communities for kids starting with the schools and provides a series of resources for municipalities across the state of Massachusetts to be able to do that. Um, lots of kind of grassroots actions, um, provides education and professional development for, for teachers to be able to do um, pedestrian safety and um, bike safety courses um, and projects. Um, and then even provides um, support up to $1.5 million for infrastructure and intersection upgrades uh, within two miles of a school. So it doesn't even need to be on school grounds. So um, I am a kind of a walking and biking nerd anyway, and um, live downtown and my daughter walked to Wildwood and now she walks to Arms. Um, and so this stuff just kind of appeals to me. So when I heard about Safe Roots, I was like, sure, I'll do that. Um, and have worked for the past year to try to engage the school district in Safe Roots to School um, uh, with some success. 
but unfortunately we have a big power vacuum right now um, in the um, you know school system. So um, I think we just decided let's just get something happening with parents regardless um, and uh, and uh, sort of show active participation in the safe routes program that then might um, provide uh, the backdrop against which we could then go ask for some money um, to pay for infrastructure and um, intersection upgrades at the new Fort River elementary school site. So that's what we're doing. Um, we have 22 families signed up so far for October 4th, which is International Walk, Bike and Roll to School Day. Um, and we are, you know, just working with the principals at each school to um, have bike trains and um, walking school buses arrive to school that morning. We'll have a little bit of a reception. Um, Paul Bachman will be joining in over near the Fort River School because that's where he lives. Um, and, uh, you know, so far, I would say that that's going well. Um, at the back, back to school event yesterday, we um, recruited a bunch of additional families. We passed out free bike lights that we got from Mass Bike um, because of the new law that requires cyclists to have a headlight and a taillight on their bicycle from dusk on. Um, and so it's been pretty fun. Um, I'd say the weakness has been just uh, sort of the power vacuum at the school um, for the past four or five months. Um, in order to be able to apply for these grants, it's a sort of a joint application process that comes from both the district and the municipality. Um, but on the plus side, you know, we're going to be getting an interim superintendent soonish, I think. Um, it seems like the school committee meeting is coming up to be able to do that. Um, but then, you know, Guilford Mooring has kind of stepped in to take the lead. Um, he's the head of the DPW. He, um, I think, just our, our had Paul Bachman ink a contract with um CDM Smith, which is a consultancy to um, do an analysis of the two problem intersections at the Fort River site, um, the Route 9 Southeast Street intersection and the Northeast Main Street intersection. So um, I don't think that that's going to be done until December, meaning we'll miss the deadline for grant application at Safe Routes to School this year. Um, but potentially we could be queued up for um, for next year, you know, assuming the DPW chooses one of the options that the engineering firm brings back and we're able to create a plan and a budget around that. Um, the other downside, of course, is that Guilford right now is, um, you know, back of the envelope saying that the upgrades are going to cost between four and five million. And we're only going to get 1.5 if we get it. Um, it's a competitive program through Safe Routes. So there needs to be some other scheming done to try to figure out other ways to bring funding resources in. Um, and then there's, of course, a bunch of other upgrades. We hear from folks on Echo Hill all the time that they would never want to, you know, ride with their kid on their bike down that sidewalk between Echo Hill and Fort River on Route 9 because it's so scary. Um, so there are other things involved as well. I think the best thing that we think we can be doing is just starting the active participation, starting to get more and more families engaged in walking and biking. And um, so far, we're, we're feeling like that's going well. So that is the quick briefing from the Transportation Advisory Committee. Christine, could you tell us for the October 4th event, it, you said there's people signing up where, how would someone sign up for that? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> we don't really have anything formal. Um, last year we had the district um, promoted it several times. And so we'd just email out to the families and Deb Westmoreland kind of created an online forum and um, people would just fill out their information there and she would then just give that to me periodically. Um, 
that hasn't happened yet. So right now people are just emailing me and saying, yes, I would like to participate. And here's the school that I'm affiliated with. Um, and then each school right now, um, except for the high school in Pelham Elementary, each school has, um, you know, some parents who've agreed to lead the charge for the individual event at their school. So I just get those parents um, hooked into those, those leaders. Um, but Jesse, I'm happy to sign you up right now if you've got a school in mind that you'd like to be a part of. I, I um, sure you can sign me up. I'm not sure. <laughs> oh my, come on, you can do it. My kids up. Are you affiliated yeah, with? Yeah, sign me up. Okay. Uh, the middle school and the high school, please. Oh, nice. Yeah. So the high school, we're kind of trying to do things through the students. Um, mm -hmm. it's just a little bit of a different vibe, obviously. Um, so we do have one student who's a part of the environmental club, um, and is going to be asking the environmental club to, um, engage in, in like a, um, they do like a safe routes to school hosts a video contest each year, um, for, uh, high schoolers and you can win, I don't know, like a $500 gift card or something. So we'll see how that goes. But um, I'm happy to sign you up for the ARMS event, Jesse. Um, do you, let me um, just tell you my email. And if you just want to shoot me an email, then I'll have your contact info. Um, my email is CLL800 at AOL.com. But you're in luck. I'm one of the leaders of the ARMS event. So mm -hmm. you're on my radar screen. Thank you. Absolutely. All right. Um, I think we have another person with a hand up, um, if it makes sense. And then, Christina, you're going to stick around for Kathy's conversation as well, I hope. Um, I just... um, yeah, I hope so, too. I'll see how long I can, can, I can stick. OK, well, thank you for the update in the interim. Um, all right, Eve. Go ahead, Eve. You can unmute. Hey there. Um, so most of you all know me. Um, so I'm here as a former member of the TAC um, and uh, of its previous committees um, for well over 10 years. I've also been running a occasional column in the Indy uh, called Transportation Mode Shift. And basically I'm just here to, because, um, because Stella in, uh, invited us and, and alerted us. And even though I'm not on the TAC anymore, I still go to the most of the TAC meetings and I'm pretty active in, in transportation policy in town. Um, so mostly, I just want to say I'm thrilled you guys are engaging with transportation. Um, as you all probably know, transportation is the number one cause of carbon emissions in the state of Massachusetts at this time. Um, you also probably also know that, that Amherst actually has the potential to be a very um, bike walking transit friendly town far more than it is. And you may know that if we really want to get people out of their private cars, the most important way to do that is make them feel comfortable and safe, which is really an infrastructural choice as well as a, um, just kind of teaching people habits, which is why I'm, I'm thrilled to know that you all are engaging in this, this Fort River idea. Um, I think there's really a high potential to have it kind of be a model for the town of, of how to do things right and really make walking, biking, and transit central to what's happening and, and how that school is thought of. I personally had a child who um, I had walk from Wildwood to UMass starting in the second grade after school, and people kind of freaked out. Um, like it, it almost never happens anymore. Um, it's perfectly safe if there's actually that crossing guard at East Pleasant who stays more than 10 minutes. Um, but it's just not done. And, and so I think there's, there's, um, you know, what Christine is trying to do and what has been done on these walk to school days is great. Um, I think what you, what Kathy's going to be talking about today and you all are working on with this Fort River idea is, is an opportunity to sort of make it more fundamental at, at one place in town where children are going to be living their lives for how many years is it? Seven years. Um, so anyway, just really support what you're doing and, and thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Eve, very much. Um, all right. Uh, 
We are going to go on to agenda item number three, which is updates. Uh, so the first being solar. Um, Dwayne, do you have any updates? It's fine if you don't. That's good. <laughs> Because I don't uh, accept uh, my uh, self-proclamation or, or uh, uh, to make sure everybody is um, aware of our um, UMass uh, Clean Energy Extension um, Solar Western Mass Solar Forum, uh, which I did, which we did do an email blast earlier this week, um, inviting folks uh, to that, um, and you were all on that list. Um, so, uh, hope you received that, uh, welcome you to, to join us. It's, uh, in collaboration with a number of partners, including, uh, a number of Western Mass, uh, legislative, um, legislators, um, Mindy Dom and Joe Comerford have been planning this with us, uh, for, for half a year now. Uh, it starts next week, uh, four Tuesdays in September, starting at noon each one with different themes and topics on each one. The idea is to not necessarily resolve all the issues, but elevate the conversation and um, have people uh, well-informed and um, understanding of the various uh, perspectives and issues around the um, issues associated with solar, solar siting, solar equity, uh, solar benefits and so forth. Um, and so welcome everybody uh, to that. Um, if if anybody does have great outreach abilities to particularly Western Mass folks through social media, we also have some social media um, things <laughs> that you can push out. Um, I don't know, I'm not an expert on that, but a, a, a tweet and a Facebook thing, a post that can get uh, get get amplified, I guess. Um, so if, if anybody has that interest and ability, I'm happy to share those links with you as well. Um, on the solar uh, on the solar bylaw working group, uh, we have we do formally now have an extension from Paul Bockelman, uh, not for long, uh, but till the beginning of October, maybe October eighth, I think. But I'm guessing on Six. that October sixth. October 6th. Um, and so we have basically the month of September to, to uh, wrap things up. Um, and uh, we're going to be working on that in earnest um, each Friday. Oh, we're not every other Friday still. We may start meeting a little bit more frequently, but um, we'll determine that uh, we have our next meeting on Friday. And just big um, appreciation to, to Stephanie and to um, Christine Bestrup as well on uh, the, on the staff side for uh, working on that with us. All right. Nice. And I'll just, I'll, I just want to point out that the event that Dwayne's talking about is free and virtual, which makes it, I think, you know, for those in the audience or who may listen to this later, I, I think that's yep. helpful. <laughs> yeah. Great. I appreciate that. Yeah. Absolutely free for the public uh, and, and virtual great to join us live but the, the each session will be recorded and available as well steve uh yeah i just had a question that this uh, two questions the solar bylaw working group meeting friday this week is that starting at 11 30. yeah normal time 11 30 to 1 30 yep mm -hmm. okay and then I had, a, I had a separate question that i was in the back of my mind to ask you, Dwayne, and that's about the Massachusetts statewide, the technical potential study that was released a bit earlier this summer. Do you know if if the data are available, like the GIS data are available uh, from the study or from one of the DOER offices? You mean beyond obviously the the uh, what you can um, yeah do online? Yeah, the data under yeah, that's a good question. I I I have not. Okay. heard uh anything on that or inquired on that so um i i don't i i don't don't know that um yeah, i was i was inspired to try to uh, you know do some analyses for the town of amherst based on their data and that's not really possible to do with their interactive website um 
as, all, as well as to do some searching um, through their, their different sites and their assessments for different sites. Um, yeah, it'd be, uh, it'd be a good question for them. I mean, it seemed to, you know, especially for town planners uh, and town uh, committee members like ourselves to be able to hone in on a, on a town or a region yeah. uh, to do, to do some of that. Um, uh, so that would be uh, a useful inquiry to them. Uh, to, I, I presume to, you know, to DOER, I think would be okay. the appropriate place. I'll write to them. And, and do you have any sense how that report has been received across the Massachusetts over the course of the summer? I haven't heard too much about it, uh, quite okay. frankly. Uh, in our solar forum, um, the commissioner, DOER, is going to speak to it uh, a okay. bit on the first day, uh, on, on the first Tuesday. Uh, so um, perhaps get a sense from her. Uh, you know, it's interesting because the, the, the study was commissioned in the previous administration. Um, and, 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 and now the current administration is broadcasting it and, and using it. Um, we did ask the commissioner, you know, to talk about the study, uh, the outcomes of the study, uh, but also, and you know, to the extent that she can and is comfortable, what are they, what do they take from the study uh, with regard to um, developing their policy framework uh, moving forward? Uh, I don't know, you know, if that's not, if that's not uh, developed enough yet, she, she probably won't be able to say too much about that. Okay. But. Uh, at least we prompted her with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I get, I, I found that it was, you know, very encouraging that they were able to find so much technical solar potential, but um, I don't, I didn't think they really made a clear distinction between technical and feasible or economically feasible in that report. And I also was sort of disappointed that they didn't address what are the limitations to reaching that technical feasibility. Yeah. Um, and that's something that maybe we can talk about locally in Amherst um, later in the agenda of the solar outreach. I'm looking forward to hearing what Laura, what ideas Laura has. So to, how do we overcome those, those um, stumbling blocks or bottlenecks or restrictions that prevent us from achieving that technical potential? Yeah, perfect. And, and I, that was sort of some of my, uh, um, <clears throat> not concerns, but sort of uh, observations of like, okay, we had the technical potential to do a fair amount um, to meet our needs on the built environment, uh, but it's technical potential. And um, and one thing that we'll be discussing in the solar forum is like, what are the different challenges and market conditions in the different sectors that make, um, you know, it could be technically possible to put it on lots of roofs and commercial buildings and parking lots, but um uh what what what's reasonable to assume or what are the challenges now with regard to um uh building up those markets quickly uh, yeah. which is sort of key at this point um you know and uh um and so i'm i'm hoping to hear some insights on that well good i'm glad that'll be a topic in in the um in the tuesday forums that next uh, next month in september great and and great if if ma'am if we can sort of Think about how Amherst can be a leader in trying to accelerate that built environment. Um, that'd be great. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, all right. Updates. That was update A. Update B mm -hmm. was scheduled to be heat pumps with Lori Goldner, who's not available, but I'm going to steal that slot. Um, and ask if anyone has had a chance to look at the specialized code kind of Q question list that was sent out uh, earlier in August. Uh, what this is, just a little reminder, is that we're working with the CRC to develop kind of the questions that come with, it, does it make sense? for the town to adopt a specialized code, but sort of try to pre proactively explore the potential more specific questions, like how much is gonna cost, what, how will it change, how it will affect me, you know, all the different things. Um, and so we sent out the initial list to this group and it had, you know, quick show of hands. Has anyone had a chance to look at that? Mm -hmm. Yes, Stella. 
Um, does anyone have any feedback they want to give now or also are welcome to just put it in email form? I think I could, we, we postponed the meeting to have all the answers ready by with the CRC till September 21st. So, but we'll need some time to compile it also maybe a week from today for any further comment, but Stella, do you have anything? Something. It was very, it seemed very good. It seems very like comprehensive. It answered questions. I didn't know I, I should be asking. Right. Um, I, I think the idea, you know, I think we, the, you know, again, the idea is a comprehensive document that anyone could look at that's user friendly, that sort of helps do just what Stella said, answer questions they might not have known. And, and not necessarily biased in one way or another. It's it's just this is these are the facts. That what I have found is most of the um, anxiety or pushback against the code has been based on things that aren't actually true or a sort of a misunderstanding of of how it all works. And so that I think hopefully this document will clear a lot of that up. I don't think we need input. I just want to make sure folks understand that they are welcome and invited and it would benefit from all your input. But I, Anna and I, I think can, can button this thing up pretty nicely and have it ready for the CRC uh, with Stephanie's help as well. Jesse, did you say, I see the memo. Was there another link to like a document where you're answering the questions or are you just referring to the memo? Just the memo, we have okay. not started answering them yet. So feedback that would be helpful. Again, I, I'm not saying anyone has to do this, but sometimes there's a certain understanding or expertise or an insight that this group has that can really get to the heart of the matter. If you have an answer to one of those questions or you wanna pose a question and give an answer, we will incorporate that, your, your thoughts into it. Um, Yeah, or you might say this I could you should phrase this question differently because it would be, you know, any any input is really welcome, to be honest. Um, and you can send that feedback to Jesse and copy me, but please don't send it to the entire group. So I'll say I'm gonna give a maybe a week from today, which would be Wednesday, September 6th, if any sort of email feedback by then would be great. And that will allow us uh, a couple of weeks. We need, you know, we need to have it all done and out to the folks. It's not, you know, I think the meeting is on the 21st, but we need to have it basically ready about two weeks before that. So um, no pressure, but love to hear what anyone thinks that they're thinking all right anything else on that topic from anyone so jesse kathy is here so i'm going to promote her to a panelist all right great I have been promoted. Great. Congra congratulations on your promotion. <laughs> Stella, would, would it make sense for you to introduce this segment? Um. Yeah, maybe. It, is the sound, because my daughter's watching like videos in the background, which is enabling me to be here. Can you hear that or is it not audible? Okay, great. Um. I apologize, it is a little distracting to me. So I apologize if this is a little bit of a disorganized introduction. But basically I had reached out to Kathy um, because after a chain of conversations between me, I, I had talked with TAC as you've heard about um, ECAC and TAC collaborating on, on thinking about um, how to incorporate 
active transit and climate goals and their plan and the CARP into uh, the new Fort River plans. And then it seems like a good first step in that is establishing what's going on currently. Like, how is that already being incorporating incorporated into the plan? Is it currently being incorporated into the plan? And I forget who suggested um, that I reach out to Kathy to see about that. Um, I forget who that was. It, it might have been Stephanie. But so I reached out to Kathy and I think um, Kathy should probably introduce herself because I, I still don't have a, a, a perfect grasp of, <laughs> of how the planning process is working for Fort River. Um, but my hope is that is that she can just speak a little bit to where current thinking and planning efforts are at vis-a-vis -vis active transit access to Fort River and what current obstacles and barriers there are, which we already heard a little bit of from Chris. Um, and TAC has also put some thought into. And yeah. So would you like me to pick up on that? That would be wonderful if you could if you could fill in your own introduction. So I am I, I spoke before you earlier this year about the energy provisions for the net zero school. I am chair of the school building project, um, which means um, that I'm I've been a participant all the time, all the way through, and the issues about traffic flow, pedestrian flow, buses flows, cars flows in and out of the school and surrounding were early on um, a focus of discussion, particularly the off-campus flow. And that was, we had a lot of information provided to us by a, a traffic study, and I'm not gonna present any of that, but part of that was to inform the choice of wild, Wildwood or Fort River as a location. And what was uh, made clear to us is that traffic is an issue at both sites, but particularly at Fort River because of the two intersections. Um, they're, they're heavily trafficked intersections. So what I, I prepared a set of slides and I see Chris Lindstrom's in the audience here. And um, some of them are, you may have seen, or you can get the whole set from TAC and Christine. But it's, uh, what are we looking at in terms of the issues? So when when I, the people reached out to me, I said, I don't have solutions, but I do have some observations. So I can make my observations. And if that works, I'll just pull up the slide set to just sort of, because I think pictures and words help rather than just me talking. Um, does that work? And um, am I allowed to share my screen? Yes, Look. you're a panelist. You can go ahead. So let me see. Okay, this is me. Are you seeing uh, the slide chat? Yes, looks great. Okay, so let me just go to slideshow. Okay, so what I wanna do is a disclaimer at the very beginning. Um, I'm, I'm mainly gonna be talking about observations of my own and through the process we've gone through rather than what should we do? <laughs> um, so, so that's what this, uh, that's what I think I was asked to do. And I definitely think this should be an initiative um, that we, we pull together a group to the town, we need to do something about this because the activity has stopped on thinking of what happens when you leave the school. So right now, this is a picture of the flow for the new school. Um, the old school is sort of sitting up here. The new school, the on-campus plan is the buses will come in and out along a loop here. And this is a wide enough and long enough loop that no bus needs to queue out on this road so they can come in and they can be waiting for kids at the end of the day and they can drop off kids and there's a there's this school is going to consolidate all the special needs programs so there are vans coming in also and there's a special loading area and drop off area for the vans the cars this is different than the current flow. Right now, there are two entrances and exits, and um, there's not a cars one place, buses the other. All right, so this is a change. Cars will come in on this north 
and and they can flow around. I'm not going to do the, what the flow looks like around the parking lot. Whoops, let me stay on this. Around the parking lot. And again, this, this is a longer flow and they're going to be canopies over here. And we just added um, some extra temporary short-term parking spaces so that parents who bring a special needs child in that needs extra time can and have the time to be there with their kid. And they're gonna be safe crosswalks across from the parking area, the car area over to here. And it's not showing all the um, crosswalks and bike places, but the on-campus part, there's a lot of um, where can the kids walk, where are the crosswalks. Um, and the crossing guards right now come out at the beginning and the end of the day with a, it's a pretty efficient labor intensive, but just for a short amount of time with a stop sign, you know, to let cars out, to let help kids get across. So we're using people to help make this safer. So what, what I want to just keep in your mind is what you can't quite see here um, on this is right up here is one of the intersections, busy intersections. And just down here is another one. And it actually has this slip lane. If you drive down this road behind the bank, you can avoid the intersection and come cars can come up in here. And there have been accidents here because these cars don't always stop. So if you think of walking, you've got to cross across here, you've got to cross across here, you've got to cross up here, you have to cross here. There's a lot of places um, that if you're walking or biking. Um, so this is a screenshot of that I took from Google Maps, I, where it shows you the vegetation as well, but this is current. Um, and I just wanted to show this to impress on you the, um, here's a very busy intersection and here's a very big intersection. And you can see how close the um, this Northern entrance exit, we're able to move it a bit, we, meaning the designers, not Kathy, but the school, we can move it a bit further south, but not a lot further south than this, but it doesn't leave much space to come in and out um, when, to avoid this intersection. Down on this one, um, a very busy intersection, particularly at the beginning of the day, this is a route into UMass um, from people coming from the Belchertown part of the world. And they can avoid this traffic light if they want to by going behind the bank and coming up here. One of the people on the building committee said she had a near fatal car crash here with her kids when the car coming this way didn't stop as she was turning into the school. So it, it's dangerous. Um, Right now, there is no plan to do anything outside of this, except maybe improve the signage. You can't see Fort River School here. It's hard to see the signs. You don't get a lot of warning school ahead. Um, and that's where we, we had some discussion on uh, improving this intersection, improving this intersection, potentially closing the street off altogether. So you can't go this way if you wanna go north here you have to go to the light and take a right hand turn that we could we can do and that sits at in dpw i think they can just do it with of course some notification to the abutters who won't be thrilled um there is a parking lot at the bank so the other issue that came up when we were looking at this is southeast this street along where the school is is two lanes one lane in one direction one lane in the other which means you can't turn into a turning lane here. You have to turn into traffic. So there was some discussion of making a slip lane coming out that you could take some of this property. There's enough, um, there's enough public way to potentially make a way for cars to get in, particularly if they're going north. It doesn't help them if what they wanna do is go here and go that way, but you can, and this East Common, it's a historic common. There was some discussion of, could we put a sidewalk along there? Could the road be wider? Could we do something along this stretch? Um, it ends before that little common ends before you get to that intersection. So some of these should I just put um, question marks. We do have a new grant. The planning department got a grant and I 
uh, you just have to get the details from Chris Brestrup um, for some improvements down in this area because there's some new developments coming in and it's some improvements on sidewalks and cross truck walks, but I'm not sure what that is. Um, and I don't, I don't know the specifics, but I know Chris said, no, we haven't done anything in terms of applying for a grant specifically. There are grants that have labels like grants for schools who are near busy intersections. I mean, it's a real fit for this. Um, this, I'll just send you this whole chart set later, Stacey, uh, uh, Stephanie, um, to post, because I'm just going to flip through it. These are all from a team, Tracy Safrian, Chris Listrom, and Heather Sheldon. They sent me a presentation that they did based on observations in 2022 around Fort River. And so these are just words to say some of what I've just said. These are very busy, high traffic um, in terms of thousands of cars flying through here. So it's really good that the troughs and guards go out and stop it. Um, they, there's very poor signage. You can't see you're coming to a school. There are sidewalks, but you're having to um, cross multiple uh, areas um, to get to the school if you're walking or if you're on bike. Um, and what they did was very nice on each of the major places on what did you see there. Um, the You can turn right left right on red at one of the intersections and not the others. And this makes it dangerous for any kid that's crossing, thinking that they have a pedestrian signal. So some of these are things we can fix. The sidewalks are in pretty poor condition um, all along this approach path. Um, repeating uh, some of this, uh, there are sidewalks here, brightly painted as of 2022. The intersections are pretty well marked. Um, so it's a slightly better intersection, but it's very busy. Um, people have said they will just keep going north because they can't turn left when you're leaving the school. So there's a um, there has been a backup, a queuing of cars not being able to leave at the end of the day. Um, one observation I should make overall is leading up to COVID, but then with COVID, uh, fewer kids are riding on our buses. The buses arrive not full um, and parents are driving their children. So this is true, whether it's at the Wildwood School or the Fort River School. Um, so encouraging people to be on the bus uh, would be a big plus for some of what's happening in terms of the, the cars coming into the school. These are pictures just to give you a sense of what does it mean that the sidewalk's not great and what her intersections look like. And these are all, again, from this earlier presentation. I didn't go out to take them. Um, then, um, I, yeah, this shows this, this slip lane um, so that you can avoid this intersection over here by going through here. Um, and, and lots of cars do that, particularly in the morning. And just a little bit, it is really close to the entrance where the buses are coming, will be coming in. So if that could be shut off and cars would have to go this way, you improve the safety of what's going on and you remove one driveway that if a child was walking that they would have to cross. Um, this is kind of showing you again, the complexity of this with new developments coming in. Um, when, when I was on a different set of issues on approving some uh, affordable housing developments, a point was made, if more families are living in this uh, village center, we need to do something about walking and biking safely. It's not safe, even if you don't say the school is there. Um, so that's a indication of a stop sign. You don't actually can't see the Fort River school signs very well, the actual entrance to the school. And you don't see warnings, a school is coming soon at these other places. The signage is awful. Um, there's a, a speed sign. And some of this, I think some of the signage for the school is included in the school project on improving it because this was observed by pretty much everybody. So, okay, this is the end. Um, and I'm just going to open it up. Um, what we have talked about in the committee, but there's no action yet specified. And this is particularly Rupert, um, uh, who is on our committee, but is the in charge of facilities, in charge of worrying about buses, 
has regularly gone to the town and said, okay, what are we going to do about outside the school? What are we going to do about it? And right now we haven't had a focus. There aren't grant, other grant applications into my knowledge. Some of these questions about is would a roundabout be better at either one of those intersections um, that roundabouts are a favor of a DPW? Um, how can we improve, improve all these sidewalks and crosswalks? What about speed limits? What about changing the light structure and, and, and flashers? These have all been sitting on a, that's the town responsibility. The school project doesn't have money to do any of this external, um, but there, it clearly, um, there is grant money out there. Um, and so in my opinion, we should be, be figuring out what we wanna apply for and what we wanna do. And that's the end. I'm going to stop my sharing. Thank you so much. That was, that was amazing. I, I said I would give you observations rather than recommendations on what to do. It's an observation of where the problem areas are. And I know I know Tracy couldn't be here and I see that Chris is in the audience. I think I think there are a lot of people who can give you insights to, you know, broader who actually experience it. But I think a, a key person to be meeting or persons to bring into the meeting are the planning department and Chris Brestrup. They've been quite successful in apply, applying for grants. Um, and sometimes they're applying with, with or without the support of DPW, but with the knowledge of DPW. Um, and uh, they're pretty short. They've been short staffed, but I don't. So I think this has slipped from the top of the radar screen list, but I think it needs to go back up. The school is due to open in 2026. Um, you know, the construction will be happening up until that point. So there is some time to start paying attention or if we're gonna change mm -hmm. any of the signage of the um, that slip lane by the bank is the one I'd like to just go ahead and close it off because it's dangerous now. If any of, some of that could happen before, you certainly wouldn't wanna be doing any major anything when the school is opening, it's going to be disruptive enough. So you'd like to do it before, if we could. And that that is what I have to. Someone said to me, "Why are you talking to ECAC about this?" And I go, "They asked me, so <laughs> here I am." So it's all the time is all yours at this point. I, I have just a quick question. Um, is the, would part of this thinking include m mitigating the impacts of construction traffic as well during the, the course of the build? And, and I, maybe question slash suggestion of like, maybe there's a solution that can facilitate construction and cause that's, that'll, that's obviously got a huge impact. Um, so one of the benefits of choosing the Fort River site for this building is it's so big. So we, um, the, a lot of the, the staging of how they're building it, the first thing they're going to be doing is the geothermal wells and doing some soil preparation. They're planning on raising, bringing fill in and raising the height to deal with water and drainage issues. So that will be the first, but they can, there's enough space to bring the construction vehicles and staging onto the campus and not have them go in and out all day long. Um, so yes, that is one of the issues in Wildwood, it would have been a major problem with the one driveway on um, where would they, how would they get there <laughs> and where would they sit? Um, we probably would have had to figure out something with the middle school. So, th so that at least is potentially addressable, but I think the more we could fix some of the intersection issues and the in and out, um, uh, the the overall issue here is this is heavy tra heavy traffic. This is a commuter pathway, so it's not like we can tell cars, "Will you please try to find another way to get to UMass?" Um, if you're coming from the Belcher my town part of the world, <laughs> you know, go t take a left, don't go up this way. Um, so, but I, that's a partial answer. So some of it is that that some of the big construction and the materials, they can be bring it brought on site and it can be happen without going back and forth other than 
cars, um, you know, the, the, the workers' cars. Yeah, Laura. And then Laura, and then Christine also has a hand up. I don't know if something needs to happen to. Let Laura go and then I'll unmute Chris. Christine. Great. Kathy, how do, is there any precedent on how these types of situations have been addressed in the past? Even just the simple, this intersection is not good. We need to update it. Like, how does that process work? Because I think where I'm getting stuck is like, it sounds like this is in nobody's there would have you you're right, Laura. The first would be we have to say the intersection's a problem, and here's what we want to do about it. So you'd have to reach at least some consensus of possible design changes. And so then who does that like who does so like well who who does it? problem? People it holds, about it, it. It sits in two two key entities at the town staff level the planning staff and DPW. Okay. So when that turnaround, uh, there's a roundabout that's happening at Pomeroy Lane. One of the planning staffers saw there was an opportunity and they wrote up the grant in a convincing way and secured that money. And that one actually had, we want to do one of two things. You know, it wasn't of given it would be a rounded out, but they wanted to put in some sidewalks and a different kind of light. So it was either going to be signalized with sidewalks or turn. And so the state, they secured that grant with enough convincing arguments that it was necessary. Um, we failed up here. I up here, I live in North Amherst, past the North Amherst Library and Cherry Hill Golf Course. So any of you have had the pleasure of that intersection where it's it's kind of a nightmare. The town has failed four times to get a Mass Works grant for that intersection. Um, three times, I might be exaggerating. And I think we're gonna, we will try for it again. There is a special category called Safe Routes to School, grants for near for intersections near schools that I know Chris Brestrup was on a phone call with me where the state, a Zoom call where the state was saying, look at all these cool little pieces of money that we put for you. Um, and so you have to say, oh, I think we fit that one or if we fit this one, but we'd have to agree at the town level um, what we might wanna do there to then propose it with a cost estimate. Um, you know, so things, different things cost differently. If it was just to put some sidewalks in, uh, repave, do some that, but you probably need to do it in a package because otherwise the question would be, why can't you just do it with your existing road and sidewalk money? But if we did it because the new school is coming in and new developments are coming in, therefore we need the following. So that's what the package would look like. But those are the two key parties. They Someone needs to take a lead, one of the two, and there needs to be agreement, um, at least on the pieces of it. Okay, just one quick follow-up to that. So does the agreement need to happen before the grant can be applied for, or? I think, you know, so I'll, I'll use, the recent history of these, one a success and one a failure. The successful one didn't say specifically, but it laid out two possibilities and they both priced out at about the same amount of money. Um, so they found a category and it fit. So they didn't have, and then the town went through a process with everyone who lives, well, town-wide, but particularly anyone who lives anywhere near that intersection, businesses on what you would be preferring. And then we made a choice. So that's one where the choice came after the money. Um, in the North Amherst situation, there was something similar. There were lots of charrettes with, it could be like this and like that. And they went ahead and applied. Um, there wasn't agreement among, I just, you don't wanna know the full details of this. And there wasn't full agreement on what, um, but I had to do deep digging to find out what we'd applied for 
And it was a surprise to some people that that's what we applied for because they thought we were applying for another concept. But that's one where we had to price out rerouting a road um, and doing some things that were pretty expensive. Um, so, so I think in this situation, if it's signalized, keep the signalized intersections the same, widen the road to allow a slip lane, put sidewalks in, or put a roundabout, but change the road plus sidewalk so you could have those not full decision. And that's where then the town, uh, the people in town would get to weigh in on which choice. Um, and we did that pretty fast with the Pomeroy Lane. It wasn't like it took years. It was get a lot of input on it and then go for it because the grant had a timeline on it. But so I hope that answers, you know, it, it's, you know, it kind of is, uh, is there total disagreement? Is there at least either one of these options would be, uh, uh, would, would ease the problem? Um, we can't, we can't just say, um, change the route into Amherst. So that one isn't on our, on our, um, radar screen. Thanks. All right, let's say Chris and then Stella. Chris, you can go ahead and unmute. Hi. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Hi, Kathy. Thanks. Um, that was uh, um, nice, I guess. A good refresher, even though daunting at the same time. Um, but I did, um, I was uh, on a call with Guilford today. And just so that you know, um, I think yesterday, Paul Bockelman inked a contract with um, CDM Smith an engineering firm um, contracted by DPW to do an analysis of the two intersections. Um, and the anticipation is for that analysis to be done midwinter, December, January. Um, and um, Safe Roots is definitely on his radar screen. Um, I've also had a conversation with the Western Mass coordinator and um, Guilford about that. So I think it's also maybe even something that you can do given your stature is to convene um, Christine and Guilford together to, you know, look at a potentially $5 million budget for those two <laughs> intersections. What are the grant possibilities and the pots of money and who can apply for what? Because, um, you know, I think that DPW also, you know, I can't speak for Guilford, but often he mentions understaffing and, you know, the difficulties of sort of sifting and sorting through this stuff. So, um, I, you know, through your process, you've compiled a bunch of this knowledge and you can bring together the different folks who should be talking. But um, at least there is an analysis that will be coming from DPW in the next several months. That's fabulous news because uh, it is news to me, but it's I'm I'm glad that finally is moving because it wasn't um, earlier on in this year, um, and it's it's uh, the the school folks have been saying when are you going to do it? When are you going to do it? Each time there is a fair amount of information. There was a traffic flow study, so I will right away. Follow. I know Guilford has it, but I don't want CDM Smith to redo things that we did uh, not that long ago. Perfect. There was a traffic and, and what they did is the flow of cars, you know, time of day flow of cars um, in all directions when around the school time. Through, through those intersections in particular. They basically just gave them Fs as intersections go. Um, <laughs> but but he, he has that information. And those of you know who Guilford, he has a strong preference for roundabouts. So uh, uh, I would say very strong. Um, so it wasn't, people didn't say it can't work there. It was just, uh, Let's talk about what could work there. Um, that's really good news. 
and I will follow up. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, thank you so much again. I, I was wondering in light of, in light of the fact that, I mean, I think everybody here has, has shared goals and, um, not a ton of time, what would be kind of most helpful from this committee? And I was kind of wondering if, for example, like a memo from this committee to the planning department with maybe some language that could be cut and pasted into grants uh, would be helpful, if that would be not helpful. Um, I'm thinking here like language specific to climate, like in support of um, in support of taking action on, on these intersections and and on some of the sidewalk things, if that's something that would be useful to just save them some writing time or not. You know, I think I think coordinated efforts and information are always useful of value. Um, you know, so providing, as you've just said, some potential wording of someone is writing this up. And what I don't know is how best to get that into whom to where 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 the recipient of this has to be willing to say um, you're adding value that they don't already have. Um, you know, so when when the town applies for the big grants, there's usually multiple eyes that go on it in terms of usually someone is writing it, but people, Dave Zoma gets involved, various people get involved, just um, potentially wordsmithing it. Um, so uh, one of, I think they have the, the key pieces of information is new school and two to three new housing developments all coming into this village. So the need for need for thinking about these issues is um, is a community wide challenge. It's not just when the school is in session, it's also in the summer and in, in the breaks. Um, so that's what I don't know. I mean, I think, you, you know, T Tracy and others on TAC can tell you the extent to which their input ha they have felt has moved the needle. <laughs> in terms of the content of the grant, but I'm, I'm definitely going to stay on top of this because this has been on our radar screen from day one. So finding out that something is moving is terrific news. Um, uh, Stephanie, you have a comment, then Dwayne, then Eve. Sure. Um, just very quickly, because I know this has come up about that the two departments are DPW and planning, but I do want to note um, that people are aware that the planning staff has been short staffed by half for an extended period of time. They do have someone in zoning, but, you know, um, and he's doing great, but they're still backlogged from quite a ways. And the good news is we are, I think, moving towards um, getting an additional planner. And I think when that happens, it will certainly enable uh, the ability for the town to be applying for some of these grant you know, this grant funding. And I think there's a lot of expertise. Um, and Stella, I, you know, your offer is greatly, greatly appreciated. I think though, um, I think it would be best to sort of not go ahead and just sort of do that work because I don't want people to unnecessarily be spending their time working on something that may or may not be needed. I think, you know, I think if they need additional um, input on a sort of climate lens, they would probably reach out to me who would either pen something or reach out to you all. So I, you know, I think there's a, a process and a pathway for that, but just wanted to sort of say that I think there will be additional planners coming on that will hopefully be able to help with this effort. You know, I, I, I mentioned that in passing Stephanie, but I totally agree. I mean, we've just been short staff, you know, at the point we were thinking in the council, could we put some temporary money and just just hire a grant writer <laughs> and then hire someone temporarily to write the kind of grant we want you know so has some because uh if there's a backlog of a need to write grants you you don't get them if you don't and i know you face that with your with sustainability there's just only so much the given step the current staff can do um Wait. Yeah, uh, this has been really 
helpful, Kathy. Thank you. Um, it's an intersection or an area that I know very well living in Echo Hill um, and uh, observed a lot of what you had had had, uh, had said, uh, but to understand it sort of from a traffic perspective, it's really helpful. And, and, and uh, what's going on with, with specifically with regard to the school and the construction. I guess my question is, is, um, you know, most of what you presented and, and it seems like is being looked at is how to make this traffic flow um, better for cars and buses um, um, and, and, and better signage and, and all that's critically important. Um, I guess I'm, and I'm not an expert in transportation, particularly uh, uh, sort of bicycles and pedestrian. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, are there are there considerations that we should be ECAC um, should be thinking about, um, and maybe and Christine with this safer school, uh, I forget exactly the name of it. Are there sort of best practices with regard to um, how to make this friendly for kids on bikes and and kid pedestrians? Um, are there are there technical options out there that we should be putting forward dedicated bike lane in certain proximity to the school, maybe um, uh, open only during beginning and end of school, um, a bridge over these intersections for pedestrians and a bicycle. Uh, no, uh, I hear what you're saying. And I think that is, I, that would be a good focus. You know, one of the issues, this is an elementary school. These are young kids. Yeah. Um, At what and, point and is it so, safe enough? For us so, to Sandy, I know that I biked to school when I was a kid, but it didn't look like this, you know, my and I had a sidewalk all the way to school, you know, not because no one walked on our sidewalk. So we just rode our bikes on the sidewalk, you know, and when we got to one busy intersection, there was an under there was an under tunnel. We just went under. It was under the train tracks, actually, you know, so it was I thought we were riding forever, but we were apparently riding a mile and a quarter. <laughs> when, you, when you were in fourth grade, it felt like you were really. But my parents didn't think twice about sending us off on our bikes. The observation has been not a lot of kids walk to Fort River. That doesn't mean there aren't there aren't kids who live within a distance that they could walk or there wouldn't be more kids. So trying to think of how to make it safer to get there, walking or riding a bike is uh really good one there is a there's a back there is a path that goes off the back of the school to kind of swamp lands but there is a path but then we own some community gardens the town does yep. there's not a bridge to them and so it's been on the list for a while from Dave Zomick to link it over so the kids at the school could actually go over and look at the community gardens, but make it easy. And that's where this new housing complex is coming in. So it's not a bridge over a road as much as a bridge over a brook. You know, it's mm -hmm. so, but trying to um, walk around out there to see what you think, um, you know, a protected bike lane that wasn't off the road. <laughs> I'm not sure how protected it would be, but if it was one of these, the sidewalk got wider and there was a clear place for bikes, um, then that would be protected. And so some of what I identified is that green. Mm -hmm. It's a historic green. Could anything be built on that? Or is this one of these, thou shalt not touch it? Um, uh, it's pretty small. You know, could, you know, are there other opportunities there to just make it wide enough for walkers and bikers um, and then think of where they're coming from? Yeah. Um, I think Eve is next, then Chris, then Laura. Hey there. So Dwayne, you had a perfect question to segue into what I wanted to say, which is to me, your role more than anything else is going to be to say that at every step of this process, the folks who are thinking about this need to think about how to increase the share of people, both students and parents who are walking and biking and, um, and do think about parents and not just kids, because 
Um, there are a lot of low income housing complexes up Belcherton Road and up um, Amherst Road where people don't have cars. So you want them to be able to walk or bike or take the bus and feel safe doing it to their kids' school so they're not having to pay for an Uber or, or just not go. So think about both kids and parents and just, yeah, it seems really clear to me that the role of somebody who's concerned about climate change and energy, your role is going to be, you don't have to come up with the traffic answers, you know what I mean? Um, but you can come up with the emphasis and the questions. So even these two studies that are being done on these two intersections, um, having worked with Guilford from the TAC and other transportation committees all these years, you know, Guilford often thinks about um, how do we get traffic moving efficiently? And he tends to think about current numbers of pedestrians. Um, and, and it seems like part of what your role could really be to say is say, even in these two studies, think about how do we actually increase um, how many pedestrians and how many cyclists we have. You know, there's other kinds of micro mobility as well, scooters, it could be, you know, wheelchair aids, maybe there's elderly people around the corner who are going to want to be, you know, using their walkers um, in these areas. How do you make all of these modes of transportation more possible and, and the choice that people are going to pick rather than their private cars all the time? And and frankly, that's going to improve the traffic there. The, um, just one other brief little comment on um you know, I guess it's an example is, um, yeah, Guilford often does love um, roundabouts. I'm often much more, um, what's it called, agnostic. I, I really think whether a roundabout is good really depends on the specific situation. Um, and in this case, the thing I would be concerned about, and this is just one example of the kind of thing that would be considered um, in, a, in a different kind of, well, depending on how you frame the intersection studies, but if you have a roundabout, you don't have an automatic time where there's a period of time when there's no traffic turning, right? Or no traffic going. And those moments are often really crucial times for people to cross streets, especially in mid-block crossings. Um, so, you know, think about um, kids crossing that, what is that street? Anyway, whatever, is that East Street there? Um, if they're crossing that street, it, if there's a roundabout, it might be really great most of the time, um, you know, not, but maybe not right at the beginning and the end of school when you're going to have kids crossing streets. And if cars are just flowing and flowing and flowing and flowing, it's going to be much harder to find a safe space. So I don't know that that's the answer, but it, it provides an example of why insisting that that question be asked at every step is really going to matter. Great comment. Um, stay, Laura, go ahead. I think Chris put her hand. Um, yeah, just my comment when I raised my hand was to Kathy's mention of potentially hiring a grant writer or something to that effect, just to note that there's a significant amount of funding available from the Inflation Reduction Act to support a whole host of things related to clean energy that I think is, so not related specifically to transportation, but just saying that there's a whole, I think the number of grants and paperwork and things we will need to apply for to be able to leverage all of these fundings that are available is going to increase significantly. And so if there's a, just flagging that I think there's a need there. Um, and maybe it's a bundled need of some sort. Um, the point that I wanted to raise after Eve's comment is the challenge that ECAC has as well as TAC is that we're advisory committees and there's absolutely no requirement to incorporate us into any of this stuff. So I'm just also flagging that for Kathy because I think that's a big problem with all of this work, right? Is that, um, you know, Stephanie's carrying um, the workload of many, 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 many people and, you know, trying to get in, into these conversations and there's no checks or balances for ECAC to be involved in these conversations either necessarily. So just flagging that as one of the potential challenges and ensuring 
to Eve's good point that mode shifting away from private cars be considered in any decisions we're making about transportation now and into the future. Yeah, that's that's super important. And I'm as the moderator, I'll, I'll insert my. I'm going to cut in line and say, as we look at some of these projects and these millions of dollars, I would ask the question because I don't know the answer is like, are the solutions of humans with signs and flags and engagement are those solutions good and positive and do they work well? And could the millions of dollars of asphalt be used? for something else, potentially. Um, no one needs to necessarily answer that, but keep that in mind. Um, all right, I, I think it's Jeremy and then Christine back in order. Jeremy, you can go ahead and unmute. Yeah, hi, uh, Jeremy Anderson, can you hear me okay? Yes. Hi, um, yeah, thank you so much for this and had the pleasure of, of meeting uh, Kathy and, and talking to Stella. A little bit about uh, safety zones. One thing that's that's really kind of struck me. Uh, I live in North Amherst, uh, mm -hmm. and just biking on Northeast Street. Sorry, you've <laughs> got to interrupt it. Wesley, can I come here? I'll, I'll find it for you. Okay. Uh, biking on on Northeast Street uh, to me is terrifying, and, and I'm an adult, and I've been biking my whole life. I similarly, I, I used to bike to school, and it was a pleasure. Uh, Eric, who my older son, who's now in first grade, he asked to bike to Fort River. Uh, at the end of the school year and I was just like I, I no I'm, I'm so sorry but I just you know it breaks my heart but I, I don't feel safe uh, biking on Northeast Street because cars go so fast and I feel like across the town there's so much speeding there's so many people going excessively fast and if there's stuff that we can do to set a, a lower speed limit for the entire town or establish some of these safety zones that would lower the speed limits for parks for playgrounds for for you know for the whole you know, just make our town just calmer, that might make it more bike friendly and it might help some of these uh, plans uh, going forward. That's great, Jeremy, thank you. Um, I also remember biking as a kid and I don't remember even seeing a bike helmet until I got to college. Um, Chris, go ahead. Hi. Um, uh, so one idea I had was to, um, well, first of all, Jeremy Anderson, my email is CLL800 at AOL.com. And you should email me so you can participate in our walk, bike, bike roll to school day on October 4th, which is a special day where you should bike with your son. But um one idea would be a joint letter from the two committees um, that is raising, I think, two points. One, um, and I could never drill down on the data on this, but each school actually has a walk zone and each school administrator knows the number of kids who live within it. And the comparison is so when we were out doing those counts last spring that Kathy has incorporated into her presentation and looking at each school and counting the number of cyclists and um, walkers, the number of walkers and cyclists was nowhere near um, the number of kids who actually are within the walk zone. Um, and so if we could, um, and I'm just thinking I've got to go back to <laughs> It's hard to get anything from the school district right now, but try to get those numbers again, because I think that's where we could really drill down on what an increase in walkers and cyclists would look like if we could even map what where those walkers are and figure out which neighborhoods they are concentrated in and what are the things that we need to do to remove barriers for those walkers um, I think that would be actually extremely helpful because otherwise it just feels a little bit like throwing spaghetti at the wall and, you know, it's, it's this person happens to live up in Amherst near Shootsbury, yet they like to bike every day to school with their kid. And that's totally different than somebody who lives 
in University Village on North Pleasant and would never dream of biking through UMass to go to Wildwood. Um, so if we could um, figure out how those circles are drawn and maybe try to coordinate with the district to drill down on the walk zones, that could potentially yield increases. Um, and the second way to yield increases is to do a set of those things that aren't super, that don't require four or $5 million. Kathy, your whole presentation was filled with them, like brighten up the, you know, redo the crosswalks, get rid of the vegetation. Um, you know, I, some of this stuff is, um, it's just not, maybe even we have a couple of cleanup days, but I think if we got our heads together around some of that, um, I don't want to call it lower hanging fruit, but I think you guys know what I'm talking about. There's a set of things that we could probably do now um, just to, on the margins, improve the walking and biking experience for folks. Um, and so, you know, maybe again, Kathy, not to put more on you, but convening us or convening the, I don't know, I have to think about it a little bit more, but it seems like between the two committees, um, there's some work that can be done there to start the increasing now. Um, and we don't necessarily have to wait for these big grants to get applied for. Kathy, do you want to respond directly to that? And then uh, yeah, I, well, I just, you know, I just, um, I'm, I think it's great that you're having this conversation because I think the school building committee itself will not be having much of this. There is a lot of interest of people, the staff within the school um, looking forward to pieces. They, um, I didn't get the information before I got here, but we did get a MassWorks grant from, for the intersection that's gonna be doing some improvement with sidewalks around the Route 9 Southeast Street, going down to Stanley Street. Um, they have some money, so they've started to work on that. And their plans for a larger project, I'm just reading from an email I got, uh, 10 minutes ago <laughs> uh, that show a larger project that try thinking of travel lanes and bike lanes. Um, so there is, there is work that has been put toward this. I didn't want to say that nothing has been done, but the, the one other thing with Christine, you just raised, we did ask for it. I'll just have to figure out if I can find it. When we were looking at Wildwood and Fort river as the two locations, we asked of the existing student population, how many lived within a mile, lived within three miles, whether or not they walked. We have that information. So you don't have to ask the school for it again. I have it. Um, and they did have their best guess of walking. You know, it was a fraction of the potential. And they just did it by uh, addresses. Um, and some of them, our buses will pick up those kids. They don't they don't say, you know, you live too close and we just won't get you. Um, but the buses arrive pretty empty. Um, so I just, um, I, I can find that information. So there is some work that, that before we lost planning staff, they got this mass work grant to begin to do some work, but not right around the school. It's going toward this new development. So I, I just, I didn't want to leave the impression that nothing is being done. And the great news is that Paul is starting to look at this. I do think human, watching people go out the crossing guards, they make a huge difference. Just all the cars stop. I said, this is only if it's, it's the custodians who take part of their day and they knew all the kids. They were just helping them cross the street, helping cars. And I thought that's a good human way to have a connection with the people who work in your school. I, I thought it was a, it was a low cost way um, that made people connections. I liked it. Um, yeah, I love that. And and I love Chris's vision of the sort of school spilling out to that whole stretch of street and being and sort of in, inhabiting that space as as being very clearly the street of the school. Um, would it make sense for Eve to be our last comment for this conversation and to thank everyone after that? It's timing wise, Stephanie, am I right about that? All right, Eve. Thanks. I just wanted to thank all of you. Um, and offer one little lobbying pitch um, to the extent you um, can use your advisory capacity to add to the tax voice. 
The um, pedestrian and bicycle plan never had its map finished. And because of that, it really just can't move forward in guiding what happens in this town. And it would be lovely to have someone besides the tax say that that's important to get finished um, and to, to build on it. Yeah, that's huge. That's And that falls very much under our purview of things to advise on the increase in pedestrians and bikes is a decrease in automobiles and carbon. And that is well within our sort of scope of advising. Um, Stella, do you have any closing remarks on this? I thank you guys so no, much. No, I thought that was wonderful. Right. Thank you so much to everybody. It is it is daunting, as Chris says, but it's great to have so many voices in the room. Thank you. So I'll sign much. off. You're welcome. If you, if you want me to send, I can send this chart set to you, Stephanie, if people want to go back. It, and I just, I did put the credit, all those, most of the words and the pictures, with exception for a couple, will, all came from the work of Stephanie and people before. Um, I just excerpted them with permission. But so goodbye and thank you. All right. We're going to move on to back to topic four, discussion, um, ECAC meeting time. So, Jesse, I can speak to that. Lori had actually suggested that. Um, I think at the last meeting, she had mentioned maybe starting the meetings at five, but I think maintaining a 630 end time, I would actually suggest that you don't shorten the meeting. If you start at five, I would suggest you go to seven um, because you can always end the meetings earlier, but you want to at least maintain that two hour block because um, I'm thinking about the times that you have things like guest speakers or an educational series. You want to make sure you allow the time for a full hour of committee work and then an hour presentation time. So I, I think you all can discuss whether you think it warrants um, changing the time. That's certainly up to you all. I wonder if that's a discussion we might want to have when the complete group is here. Um, in fact, I would suggest that and that five of us think about our position on that since this is maybe, for, at least for me, it's the first time I'm hearing about it. Does anyone object to that? No, I agree, especially since Lori said it was based on a class she's teaching. So I think it's pretty important that she be here. Great. All right, um, it is six o'clock. Um, I wanna just sort of look at the agenda for a second here. Um, I think what we have left, and just, and do, do any triage that we need to, we've got the solar outreach um, that Laura's gonna talk about, um, energy efficiency for renters, rental disclosure, bylaw those are the only, and then our regular and then staff updates and ECAC updates um I think we can get that all in give everything gets a couple minutes Laura do, do, you, do you think is it how long do you need for that um I don't have much of an update um I have been doing a little bit of digging around um I think Dwayne from the minutes last time Dwayne mentioned this as well. Some of this stuff is still up in the air. So I think we need to figure out who um when the right time to have this meeting is and whether we want to do a pre-meeting with just some folks who might be more in the weeds on some of this to talk about um, you know, when to so so to back up for a second, right? The idea is that we now have through the Inflation Reduction Act, this ability to access, non-taxpaying entities have a bit ability to access significantly more credits than they have in the past. And it's not just about solar, it's about heat pumps, it's about geothermal, it's about a whole host of things. And so what we want to do eventually is get 
help get this information out to all those non-tax paying entities who maybe in the past have looked into solar and realized it was never, it wasn't going to be too expensive. Um, and there's a whole host of them, nonprofit institutions, um, the schools, like you know, private schools, um, the churches and other other groups like that. Of course, it also applies to the town and to the colleges in town. Um, and I imagine the colleges in town already know this and are figuring out how to leverage it. So potentially there's an opportunity there to learn from what they're doing. Um, but I also, so, so potentially before we do a larger information section, se session where we try to bring in as many people from all these organizations. Maybe we need a smaller session with just a handful of people that are a little bit more in the know to start to figure out when it would make sense to do a, a larger a larger session. Um, there is good guidance out there already. Like the Blue Green Alliance has a guidance on how to use some of these tax credits. Um, the other question that flows to mind is like, how do we do... Um, is there a way to do bridge funding to help some of these organizations because they're not going to get the, they have to do the project before they get the money back. Um, so all, all to say we have this Excel sheet, there's not many partner groups on there, but maybe we, I mean, there are a handful of partner groups on there. Um, And we've got a handful of like ideas for the non-tax paying entities, but maybe we need to start with a smaller meeting with maybe even just some of the college folks or I don't know, Stephanie, if anybody in your side of the shop has been talking about this or thinking about this at all. So we started, I mean, we certainly became aware, but unfortunately um, losing Sean was a huge hit. I mean, mm -hmm. I I can't even talk about it. <laughs> so I feel like um, our capacity right now, because we've got two people who are already in two other departments that are kind of covering until we hire somebody else. So I kind of feel like we're at a bit of a deficit for um, a bit until we get somebody to fill that position, because that person's going to be the key person that we really want to have at the table for the mm -hmm. discussions. Um and if Sean would have, I mean, it would have been great if we had Sean still, but we don't. So I'll stop. <laughs> I am going to talk with um, someone from the library project this week about this, because I do think it has implications for that project. Um, so, but beyond that, I haven't much information. So I think we should keep it on the agenda. And if folks have ideas or, um, you know, and maybe we can start, I can also start to ask around to some of the college folks to see if they've started to figure out how to, uh, how they're factoring. I think the main question I have is like, how do you factor this into the planning for a project? Um, when the project's already been, how do you factor this into the planning for the project? And would it allow you to, um, you know, consider heat pumps or other things that maybe you hadn't considered before? Um, so. All right, so that'll be ongoing. Um, Number seven, discussion, improving energy efficiency for renters. Uh, who's Who owns that topic? Steve. Here I am, yes. Um, I summarized a little bit last meeting um, about some of the efforts that we had undertaken and where they had led to which was unfortunately sort of nowhere, at least as far as getting energy efficiency um, improvements incorporated into the rental 
registration bylaw that the town is considering now. Um, so that was a little bit disappointing. Um, I think what what I would like to do, I guess, is be to regroup and look back at the options that are available. And um, perhaps if we can form, forget what we used to call it, but a subcommittee or a team of two of us or three of us, maybe even bring in community members again, um, review those options that are available for potentially improving energy efficiency, uh, and then combine that with any new information that might be coming from the Empower grant that um, is active and see if they've been able to do some surveys of renters um, and then chart a plan forward. So maybe at this point, we think about you know who on the ECAC would be interested in, in taking this on as a task. Um, I certainly am. And, um, and then we could potentially get to work basically re-researching re the options and looking at those that might be the most profitable to pursue. Stephanie has a hand up. Thank you. Um, so just a reminder that if two of you are specifically tasked with doing this, then it becomes a sub subcommittee that needs to be posted with regular meetings. So not that it should stop you, I'm just sort of telling you that that becomes an official subcommittee. So one of you could say you wanna do it and you could reach out to another person uh, or another person could offer to give you information from the committee, but um, as long as they're not officially kind of appointed in that role, then you wouldn't maybe be subject to the, to the um, officially having to post subcommittee meetings. So there's just that piece. Uh, I did wanna say that I just today finally received all of the materials from the um, renter outreach, uh, survey outreach effort from the Mass oh, wow. um, CEC Empower Grant. So, I mean, we'd been working along, I didn't have a lot to report because it was mainly just, they were conducting the surveys and getting the information. So I have all of that information now. Um, but thinking that I may need to uh, reach out to maybe you, Duane, about seeing if you have any students who are looking for a project, <laughs> because I um, it's a it's a lot of surveys. I think they got something like two hundred and fifty to three hundred surveys completed. Um, so all of that information needs to be compiled and then put into some report format. So I could really use some assistance. I, I mm -hmm. don't think I'll really have the time to do that kind of work right now. What what time frame are you thinking of? So what we have we have plenty of time in terms of the grant funding. So I can follow up with you outside of this meeting on that to see if you have uh, a student you might be looking for a project for. I mean, would the, would the data be available to work on this fall semester? Yes, uh, it's ready now. Okay, gotcha. Okay, so yeah. I can, I mean, I literally physically have all of the materials here and I think might even be able to offer um, a space if they wanted to come in um, to work with all of the, all of the data. Mm -hmm. So we can, we can talk about it offline. Okay, thanks. That, that's great, Stephanie, that you've gotten some of those results. That's, uh, it's been a while, but it'd be, it'd be really neat to look through those and see what kind of ideas and recommendations have, have come from that survey. Yeah, and I would say, I don't know that there's, again, this was led by uh, residents and renters. And so we identified community captains. They were the ones in charge. I had very little to do with this. They came up with, uh, with the questions. Um, I think it'll give you some idea. I don't know how much it will give you. Um, and I haven't looked at them myself uh, as of yet. Um, but I think it's just, you know, the one thing I will say that I heard from uh, at least some of the captains during the process was that most people are concerned about their rents being raised. Uh, I think that's yeah. kind of the the number one concern is if we do this, will landlords raise our rents? So everyone's sort of on board with the idea, but no one wants to end up having to foot the bill as part of their rent. Yeah. 
So um, just, just that that's a concern, that's all. So yeah. I think that's the kind of feedback you'll get. I don't know that there's gonna be a lot of new ideas generated, so. Well, the, the last time we did this, do, do you remember, Stephanie? It was uh, me and um, um, Chris Riddle and, as a community member, um, and who was the ECAC member? Um, Andra. Andra, right, right. Was Andra. on it. Do, and Felicia we, Mednick was also right, on it Felicia. as well. And so did we do those? The, were our meetings officially posted in public meetings when we met? At the time, I don't think they were because it was an RMI effort and no one was officially assigned to do it. Oh, okay. That's um, right. And I think it was just participating in the RMI effort. So you weren't necessarily, I think Andra was identified as the liaison, the official liaison, but then you became the official liaison okay. at one point. So, um, but I, but I think you're doing something different now. And I think that would very much, um, fall into the category of like a subcommittee if you were to sort of identify a few of yeah, you in okay. a group of people. All right. Well, I guess I would suggest at this point would be for to encourage ECAC members to really think about if they want to help with this and if so, to what level. And um, maybe we come back to this at the next meeting, Jesse and, and Stephanie. Uh, and and see if there's a, a willingness and ability to put some time and energy into this this particular strategy. I think it's a good one. There's plenty of guidance from RMI, from ACEEE, the American something something energy efficiency. Um, there's examples all around in, in Massachusetts and different states for how this has been done. So we don't have to totally reinvent the wheel. I think we could adopt. But it will take time to find different programs, evaluate them, and then figure out how we would go about getting them implemented in Amherst. You know, whether they are voluntary programs where we're you know, looking for building owners that are happily willing to work with PACE or other incentives, or whether we try to do something that might be a little bit bigger lift, but to have something that's a bit more of a requirement, like energy disclosure of rental properties, um, or even required inspections or um, ratings of buildings. So there's kind of the whole gamut there of exciting options that we could pursue. <laughs> exciting, huh, Laura? <laughs> <laughs> and, and maybe when we get two new ECAC members, uh, one of them will have some interest and expertise in this area too. Maybe the we other, can find some to recruit. <laughs> also, I, yeah. as I was just checking the minutes, the other thing we might want to talk about, at least briefly, or plan to talk about next time, will be the block party, the Amherst block party, and how ECAC is going to present at that. Our minutes from last meeting sort of left that open as to what we might want to focus on. And we might need to spend a little time before September to 21 with um, figuring that out. So I'll end that or stop talking about rental efficiency for now. Um, great. And I will just say, I'm going to plant a quick seed on the block party, which is that what if we all had a big pin that said, I'm on the town's climate committee, ask me about what's going on. And then we all showed up to the block party. And then we're not setting up a table. We're not shutting down a table. We're not making a schedule. We don't have a doodle poll. We just have a sweet pin that says, ask me about the town's energy and climate action committee. And we all commit to show up for as much of that event as we can. So think about that. And then next on the list, I think is staff updates. Is that right? Uh, it is if you're um, merging the seven and eight, which I think you are. I think I Steve's think presentation think, was so. I think that was, yeah. Yes. Yes, definitely. Okay. Sorry. Just give me one second. I made some notes here. Um, let's see. So, uh, so actually the first thing I had on my agenda was the block party. Um, 
Angela Mills did reach out to me, uh, or I followed up with her saying that you all wanted a table. Uh, my question was, do you want to share a table? Do you want your own table? There are six foot tables and eight foot tables. I just need to know for Angela's sake, what you want to do. If you say you're going to share a table, um, either it would be good to know what organization you want to share with, but I think all the towns, committees, and departments that are going to be there are going to be together. So for instance, I think in the past you had Sunrise share part of the table. I don't know that you would necessarily do that this time. I think the idea is that all the town committees and departments are kind of together in front of the fire station. So I just need to know what you want. Stephanie, do you know if Mass Save is going to have a presence at the block party? I do not know. Because that one of my ideas was that we could continue to promote the existing services that Mass Save provides to homeowners, to renters, and to property owners. Um, it would be redundant if they were there also promoting that. But if they're not, then that could be a thing that we have some of their information to pass out. It could, it could be one of several things we're prepared to share with visitors at the block party. Right. So it's usually um, another organization like Mass CEC or somebody else that tends to right, yeah. promote the Mass Save programming. So I don't, and I don't know because I'm not organizing this event, so I don't know who they have signed up, but I can maybe Yeah, it could be ask. a utility company. Yeah, and I was going to say, or it could be the utility company, because at the Sustainability Festival, Eversource actually often promoted the Mass Save programming. Okay. So um, I, I don't know who they have doing that. Is that something you or could find all. out if there's some going to be I a group? can ask. Um, I'd, I'd say don't put a huge amount of time into researching it, but if you can ask Angela or somebody and somebody says yes or no, that, I would be in favor of having a table and the buttons that Jesse described. <laughs> and we have maybe three or four different things that we could promote. And we, we talked about possibilities. There's the, the green, the Valley Green Energy program. If, if that's ready for prime time, I don't know. Um, we could talk about, uh, be prepared to talk about PACE, although there's probably not a big audience for that at the Black Party. Um, um, I think if the bike to schools day is the fourth, that could be a thing. Yeah, that could be a great. There's a huge audience for that at the block party. Yeah, so I think we yeah, could so give us give us a table along with the the rest of the town. I mean, it, by the fire station, that that's a great location. It's busy. It's happening, and they provide a table for us. That sounds sweet. Yeah. So again, I mean, is TAC going to be present? I don't know. I can find out. I can look. I mean, maybe you want to share the table with TAC to promote this program. Um, I would say as far as Valley Green Energy, we're not, you know, the application hasn't been submitted yet because we're waiting on one of the towns to get some information for the application, um, which they haven't. They've been um, slow to get that information that's needed. So when that comes in, which I think is going to be soon, However, but I don't think we'll be ready in time to be promoting anything specifically on that date. So I wouldn't necessarily focus on that. The heat pump program, um, it's been taking a really long time because of getting the RFP together. Um, Sean was kind of working with me on that. He left, but um, because I went on vacation, I think just before vacation, I had some quick correspondence with him that I have to look back to, but I may be at a point where I might be able to release the RFP. So I have to work with the procurement officer. Again, I just don't know the timing of that. And I don't know how much I'll be able to say because even if we can put out the RFP, likely we're just going to be looking for potential consultants to work with us and i won't have much information really provided at that point so not much to say about the epom program but i think you know this bike to school program seems something very very specific and tangible so maybe that's the thing you want to really kind of focus on for this event and sort of help get the word out about that the we other thing also i want have... go ahead well, so the other thing, and I've been saying this for quite a while, and I think this is really kind of a basic thing, is just like, 
people need to save energy. Like we keep, we're, we're talking about the technology all the time and all this incredible technology that we have and what we're trying to promote, but like we're losing, I feel, and I'm not just saying we as an ECAC, but I just feel like even in the bigger context of the climate, we're sort of losing some of that basic, like people need to unplug, people need to walk more, people like those are the some of the concepts that are so basic. It's like the simple, straightforward stuff that we need to be talking more about. And I, I really would love to see more of us stop using so much energy. Unplug. Limit your limit your time on your phone, on your computer. Um, shut off your TV. Like those are things I think we're we're needing to really get people to sort of. We need to go a bit old school, I guess. So I I just feel like those are some really good conversations to have, and that's a good venue to do that and those don't require a whole lot of um materials and stuff education it's like let's talk about what you do during your day maybe we could have people pledge like have a pledge for the event like i'll use less energy i'll i'll be on my computer you know less x number of hours a week or my phone less x number of hours a week or something like that i don't know i'm just throwing some ideas out there And I think uh, the only other really quick thing that I have um, is uh, I I had a visit from an advocate uh, activist, Janet Rothrock, who is from Concord, and she um, has been really actively engaged in the um, opposition to the Hanscom Air Force Base expansion, specifically due to how it will really have an impact on the state's goals for carbon emissions. And so she gave me a flyer. I will share that with you. Um, I'm not necessarily promoting, I'm just sharing information. So I just, and I gave her some names of some activists within this community that would be probably interested in getting more information or getting on board. But I will um, copy that flyer and send that all to, to you as a committee and I'll post it in the meeting packet too for the general public in case people are interested. And that's pretty much the stuff that I have for today. And just quickly before you go, Laura, do you do you need an answer today on on the table? And can we just say yes, we want a table and put us with someone cool? Um, oh, you said Laura, so I think you meant me. Um, yeah, I just. No, I, mean, to... I mean, she got her hand up. I just. Oh, oh. I just want before she speaks, I yeah, just yeah. want to ask you, Stephanie, you do need that answer today. I need it as soon as possible. No, I think we can make. I think we can make that call. There's five of us. We want a table. Okay, and six foot fine. I I don't think you need an eight foot table. So do um, they make so a seven foot? <laughs> Just kidding, Jesse. Um, sorry. <laughs> okay, so yes on six foot table. All right, I will let her know. All right, Laura. Yeah, I was just going to say, and caveating this completely, that I will not be in town for the block party because it's climate week in New York City, so I will not be able to help. But um, I like the idea of, like, maybe having, like, <clears throat> just a couple, like, lists of, like, want to learn more about this? Put your email here. Want to, like, sort of, like, collecting people's names so that then we can follow back up with them. Cause I feel like you don't retain a lot of information at the block party, but maybe if we could get some people to sign up, like we're doing the work, bike to school thing. Like you have any interest, give us your name and we'll reach out back out to you. And like TAC can take that on or um, like the direct pay thing. Like this is a place where we could collect, like, do you work for a nonprofit or that might be able to benefit from funding to support solar and, electrification if so give us your email right um so like we could just have some some papers signed up for that so that was my idea i like that idea that's good i think that networking is part of a big part of we've had some great moments of networking and let's keep that going i love that um all right, I see. ECAC member updates, and you have two minutes.
I'll be really quick, but since it's a transit heavy meeting already, I'll just like throw it out there, <laughs> which is I, um, these headphones are, are feel strange to me, but anyways, uh, I had this really frustrating situation. Well, it wasn't a frustrating situation. It was like, I was doing like tree work with, uh, an elect electric hatchback and a trailer. So not like a heavy duty vehicle, uh, and I realized there's like nowhere to charge even a light duty commercial vehicle. So I just wanted to like flag that because basically none of the level two chargers or like even the faster chargers that are scattered up about are set up for any type of like vehicle with trailer, like lengthy vehicle. Um, and I think that's gonna become an issue hopefully really quickly because like if they're not set up for like light duty commercial vehicles and they're definitely not set up for you know heavier duty commercial vehicles um i don't know i just found that interesting i was like suddenly oh i have this like trailer on my car and i like can't charge it anywhere so that was interesting specifically the like cords aren't long enough and the like parking places aren't oriented correctly Interesting. That's a cool or not cool observation. Um, Stephanie, I have a question request slash no pressure, no rush on it, but I would love to see whenever it is available. And I'm sure this is on your list, the work that the fellows did this summer. Um, yeah, I yeah, I, I will send it out as soon as it's available. I do have Miguel's, but I want to send them together. So um, Caitlin cool. just had some work she wanted to do to finalize hers. So when they are both complete, they will go out to the town manager, to the ECAC. You'll you'll all get no, them. So and no they'll be rush. posted where we are. Oh, and I should say work is happening on the dashboard. Um, kind of taking our time a little bit with that because I do want to get some of this information loaded, uploaded on it as well. Um, but we are making some progress. Um, may take a little while longer, but uh, it is coming along. So um, that will those reports will be part of it. What I wanted to see was like a page that had like all of the reports in one place: the solar studies, the climate action plan, the MVP report, the fellows' work. You know, so all of that will hopefully be in like one one stop on the dashboard. Maybe I'll close with another transportation related comment. The hordes of masses come back tomorrow, first day of move in. Be a great day not to drive for everyone. A lot of co benefits of not driving this tomorrow through the weekend as far as avoiding traffic and whatnot. So good luck with that. And I think I can adjourn the meeting. There is no public. I oh, just Steve, go ahead. I just wanted to announce I guess that is a, a blue supermoon is going to be rising in about 45 minutes and the sun is setting at about the same time so and it's cleared up so I think my family we're going to go up to Mount Pollux and see if we can watch them come up and um, rise opposite so keep your eye out for the blue supermoon the newspaper says it's a celestial rarity bigger <laughs> and brighter than usual <laughs> Fantastic. And I just add very quickly for items for the next agenda. Um, I I want to raise the feasibility study for networked geothermal. Um, so I will take my ability as note taker to add that in. Is there any other agenda items that we want to put on? Did you get the others from earlier? Um, sort of. I'll I'll put down what I have and I'll just double check it. Yeah. Okay. We could heat pumps never got discussed today, so that could get kicked down. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Have a great week. All right. Thanks, all. Thanks, Jesse. Yep. Thanks, all. Great. Thank you, everybody.